right. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, today to start with a little, a few minutes of uh, just uh, opening the floor to anyone with any questions or comments based on the things that we saw yesterday. Uh, and then we will continue. So you can use the chat to write any questions or comments that you have uh, and we will discuss them. And, and then we will continue uh, with the little, with the, a small part that was left over from yesterday that has to do with deploying online models. And then um, we'll go to recurrent neural networks. And then the larger part of today will be interpretation. Uh, then some uh, small thoughts on the conclusion. And hopefully we hope to have about an, one hour at the end or at least minimum half an hour uh, to do the, this uh, project, which um, uh, Peter uh, got some data for you. What, what's the data, Peter? What's the data set? Uh, so I, I have used uh, what we have, were talking about. Uh, so it's uh, um, classification, whether the DNA is coming from uh, coding part of the genome or whether it's like inter intergenomic. Intergenic. Intergenic sequence. Okay, so it should be. Okay, so uh, we have one question. Uh, could you explain uh, again which augmentation is not good for chest X-ray image? Uh, I think it was it was the um, flipping left to right, right? Uh, horizontal flip. Horizontal mm -hmm. flip was not good because. Uh, you care if uh, the heart is on the left side left side i have a degree in biology but <laughs> so if the heart is on the left side or you know the liver is on the right uh, or or whatever uh so so that like, was the point. like in the general yeah. you don't want to make the augmentation that will like change the meaning of your of, of your image information it, it would be the same if you do the traffic sign then you have like go to left or go to right. So so in that case, you probably don't want to flip image or I don't know, turn exactly. it. Uh, or if you are working with sequences, bi biological sequence, you don't want to flip the sequence, right? That would be, <laughs> that would be pretty, that would change the meaning a lot. You know, it depends. Like like if you, you probably can take the complementary sequence, like- Complementary, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but you know, just reversing a sequence, for example, uh, could be, could really change things. Yep. Uh, yeah, symmetry matters, right? As Chris says. Mm. Yeah, so uh, the project will be, I mean, hopefully I think should be relatively easy to, uh, you know, to build something that will actually work. Okay, what's the difference between multi-layer perceptron neural networks and deep neural networks? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so the uh, multi-layer perceptron is just, you know, the neural network that, that consists of uh, dense layers. Uh, and the deep neural network is a bit tricky word because the deep, uh, is uh, means that we have like many layers if you have like like the when the people started to work with neural networks like when i did during my phd it was usually like the input layer then one or two of the hidden layers and then like output layer you know so so basically three four layers and the deep means that that it's not just like such a shallow network but you have like many of them but, but many layers, like, I don't know, five uh, years ago, like could, could have been like eight layers, even like eight layer neural network was considered to be like very deep. Uh, I unfortunately don't have the image uh, in front of me, but, but there is like this image net data we have discussed yesterday, there's the competition and there's like how many layers uh, were in the like best solution. And it was like uh, when the deep neural networks took off, it was like eight players and it's, or, or something like that. And that won the competition. And like the next year it was like 15 layers. 
and the next layer it was like much much deeper network and, and the reason like why they were able to do that were both like the hardware advances and but also the theoretical advances like the the, the famous ResNet network basically found the trick how, how to like train uh, very deep networks. So so the so the word deep neural network is a bit tricky because the deep could mean like different thing, but like generally it means that you have like many layers. I hope it it helped a bit. I think that okay. makes sense. Uh, okay, one one more question is. Um, could you uh, change, replace the N in sequences with specific nucleotides as data augmentation, or would that also change the meaning too far? Um, I can maybe talk a little bit about that. So, um, so Ns, like generally your sequences should not have that many Ns, right? If you If you're just, uh, getting genomic sequences or or, or uh, you're using data from next generation sequencing or something. However, uh, we've been using ends sometimes uh, when we are doing padding. So if we have a sequence, let's say our model takes sequences that are 200 nucleotides long and our sequence could be anything from let's say 50 to 200, uh, we might pad that sequence with ends. And uh, one thing we've seen uh, before is that um, if you're not very, very careful to pad your positive and negative sequence in exactly the same way, it's very common that your, uh, your network will learn the, this pattern of how much padding is there and, and uh, start um, you know, learning that. The other idea would, would be to, instead of putting ends there, to just randomly pick nucleotides for this. But the problem is again, um, that uh, nucleotides in the, on the genome or whatever your base, uh, let's say thing is, transcriptome or whatever, are not randomly distributed. So there are, there are very, uh, like there are many patterns in there. So if you just start picking random nucleotides uh, to, to, to pad your sequence, you're actually creating a sequence that has a pat or a negative pattern in it. So basically you have a random, completely random sequence versus a sequence that if you picked a random genomic location would have some kind of underlying distribution. So, so it's, it, it's, these are these are things that are very tricky when you're working with uh, uh, with biological sequences, and I I have I think a slide near the end to kind of uh, tell you know remind you to pay attention uh, I, like you need to to think a lot about what how you're treating your data and if you're introducing any biases that you don't think about because your the the network will learn these things and that's where again we will talk today about interpretation interpretation comes very important because you know then you would see that you know what lights up for example is a stretch of hands instead of like a pattern within your data i don't know if i answered exactly the question but i think uh yeah those... and it's are tricky like uh, yeah. to be completely honest like there is like not really the best practice what to do with them uh sometimes like like for example yesterday we have coded n as like the fifth category what people often are also doing is they don't use the one hot encoding like completely but code n as four zeros like that, that's like another possibility so 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 people are doing like different things with them but as, as Pano said like be careful like what we will be doing today for example uh, for the classification of the coding sequences versus intergenomic sequences if I like didn't delete uh, the ends from the intergenomic sequences it would be very easy to spot them because like there are much more ends in the intergenomic sequences than like for uh, coding sequences. There, there is another like very good question. Uh, that is, uh, we used uh, transfer learning uh, 
for models trained on ImageNet? Do pre-trained layers exist in biology, e.g. to better interpret biological images or other bio biological things? And, and like that was the question that people asked a lot when people uh, start to use ImageNet pre-trained models on like medical images or even like black and white medical images like, like X-rays. Uh, so, uh, and uh, the answer is yes. The, this, like uh, you can use ImageNet pre-trained model on the, on, for completely different question. And the reason is uh, I believe what, uh, I forgot who did it, Vlasta showed it like yesterday when on, like if you go through the layers, then the, the like the layers that are very down is using those um, is is learning like those basic things. So they are learning what's the edge, what's the circle, what's the you know the composition of the circles. And uh, while it's like learn on like totally different kind of images than you have, it's still like like those kind of the things exist in your specific problem, biological, medical, as usually as well. So, so it has been proved that it's very useful, even if people would not guess that it would be useful. Yeah, and I see uh, someone, uh, Rudolf, uh, answered also and said that uh, there is also a website called uh, keepoy.org, which oh, seems to have um, uh, I just clicked on it. I didn't know this website actually, which is really interesting. And it seems mm -hmm. to have many models from um, different uh, different biological publications uh, that you can uh, oh. you know, oh, use from cool. there. So this is something we should check out definitely. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And I believe like this is kind of becoming the trend that 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 like. Uh, it's usually not within your reach to train a really big model like on, on, on those millions of images. So the like large organization like Google, Facebook, OpenAI is, is training those model for images, for text data. Unfortunately, not for so much for the DNA, but, but the, uh, it's coming. We, we unfortunately don't have it on the slides, but there are people and, and the people come, uh, are, uh, we are also doing that, like training the model, for example, for the human genome and, and do the pre-training for the human genome and then like fine tuning for some like specific case or pre-training for the uh, English Wikipedia and then like fine tuning on, on your specific task. And, and those models are now publicly available. Uh, the TensorFlow Hub, is probably the, the the good place to look at. I'll put it into the chat. I don't remember exactly. The, the main the main point the main issue is that um, the 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 task like the question that you're asking. Uh, I mean, biology is really or biomedical field is really wide. So you know, someone might be trying to do classification of cell types. Mm -hmm. Someone might be doing X-ray images. Someone might be doing other microscopy or whatever. And um, uh, in the end, um, you need to hit a balance between general uh, something, a lar very large model that is very general, uh, which you know might as well be trained on on just everything like uh, you know ImageNet. Uh, versus something that is very specific and much smaller and is trained on very specific data, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I mean, it. I guess someone could make a huge model on cell cellular structures or si shapes of cells or whatever. Uh, it it would probably not be very useful, for example, then for X rays. You know, it's not more useful than ImageNet would be. I, I imagine, um, yeah. Okay, uh, I think that maybe we we should start uh, because it's uh, like about twenty minutes into our uh, time. So maybe uh, who is going first? David, right? Okay, David's starting. Uh, you're muted. Yes. All right. Thanks. 
So let's start. Um, so uh, remember yesterday we did some uh, convolutional networks and uh, we had some examples like for example on genomic sequences or on uh, CIFAR image database. And uh, here we have a small demo to show you that we can actually very easily put those models. Once we trained them, we can put them, uh, we can export them from TensorFlow, from our Python code, and we can put them and use them in uh, JavaScript uh, to, for example, place them on a website or uh, something like this to present, uh, to let others use those models. So the main thing is that we can use a library to export the model from uh, Python from our uh, TensorFlow Python script and use it somewhere else. Uh, so uh, we will have a look at uh, the website now, how, how it looks like we have uh, there the models from yesterday. So you can find it on uh, our GitHub as everything. So it is the TensorFlow.js web page example. And it's uh, just a very simple code. Uh, this is not a JavaScript course, so we will not really go through how to place it there. But I will later leave you with a guidelines that we prepared. So if you want to do something like this, you have a template and a guideline you can use. Anyway, let's have a look here. So this is uh, the genomic. Uh, sequences convolutional neural net, which we trained our G quadruplexes yesterday. And we can load an example here if we don't have anything on our mind, like some sequence and hit predict. And we can see, all right, so there is probably no G quadruplex in this sequence. And there also we have a CNN on CIFAR which has the 10 different classes. And we can, there is an example image, so we can just see what does it predict for us. And we can also, yeah, so it's a dog with quite a big probability since we have 10 classes. So this is way above a random guess. And we can also just use some random example. So we have another dog here, or for example, we have a ship so let's see is it a ship and so you know we can load our images and this is how someone else could use your model on a website so yeah it's not an automobile i would say but we can guess why the network is thinking this because there's something that resembles a uh, pavement maybe and the road so yeah, it's not perfect but that's why we will today look into interpretability to know why our models behave how they do and the last part is a place for your model. So this is actually where you can go and find our tutorials. And we will have a look at this in a moment. Let's just uh, talk a little bit more about what we are using for this. So we are using a TensorFlow.js library. This is just for exporting the model and then so from exporting it from Python and then loading it in JavaScript. And once we are there, use any special like TensorFlow functions and stuff, we just, we just display the model and predict. Then if you want to place the model somewhere online, uh, GitHub pages is a useful thing. Uh, it basically lets you uh, just push into GitHub and then you can easily, the code that you pushed uh, with few clicks, uh, you can uh, place it on a website that GitHub is running for you. Uh, you will find all this and how to do it in a simple template and guideline that we prepared. Uh, and I will show you where you can find it. And uh, in this template, you only look into one file. Basically, you change some things. There are comments to guide you how to include your own model there. And uh, sorry, there is actually a mistake because this is from yesterday. So 
uh, today in the train in the pr project at the end if anybody is interested uh, you can tell me and we can go through these guidelines but right now I expect the uh, not all of you are here like uh, interested in putting the model online and it's quite simple so you can do it on your own also with just with the guide but during uh, our last exercise here uh, feel free to ask me about it if you want to go through it together in a separate group so uh, we've talked about the tensorflow library and uh, so yeah, I think we've said all of those the same about the GitHub pages. So it's just only one use how you can place the model online. You can do it anyhow you want. And uh, here is just example how simple it is. So remember yesterday we've uh, created our model, then we trained it and so on and so on. And all the time we are just working with the variable model, which stores the model, the train weights, and everything inside it. So only thing we actually care about is these three lines, is that we import the library, and then we just call one function, and that exports just two files for us. Then we just load those in JavaScript, and it's done. And the other functions are just here, just to like let you download it from Colab, for example, something like that. And I believe this, yeah, and I believe there is only this thing. So let me actually show you where it is, where you can find the guideline. Uh, so again, you go on our GitHub and uh, here it's the difference. You actually have to go to branches and you have to switch to uh, GitHub pages template. And here in the readme, uh, you can find all the guide to how to place the model online, how to ex export it from your code, and so on. So uh, feel free to have a look at this later. And during exercises, if anybody is feels confused here, we can go through it. But uh, it's uh, fairly simple. And also here is the template. So basically these files is all you need to have a working web page that presents your model as you have seen before in the example. And I believe right now we will uh, move to Vlasta and we will talk about another topic. Or maybe before yep. we leave. Are there any questions about that? Like the trick is that there is no server, there is no Python involved. It's really running uh, as a static web page on your computer or on some hosted uh, hosted repository like GitHub Pages. I don't see any questions, so I guess we can continue. Okay. Yep, sounds good. So I'll just share my screen and we'll go from there. All right, so um, can you see the sequence data? Yeah, everything is fine. Yep, sounds good. All right, so let's change the topic a little bit. Let's go back to the data and deep learning stuff and away from JavaScript. Um, so uh, we'll go through uh, some sequence data classification today. So let's uh, uh, remind ourselves a little bit about how do we represent the, the sequence data uh, in computer and in deep learning models. So let's have an example of the DNA sequence. We we have you know a couple of uh, bases, right? Then we can do something called tokenization, which means we will split our sequence into tokens. Uh, these tokens can be uh, uh, many things. It, for once, it can be, for example, triplets, right? Like we see on this example, or it can also be just, you know, simple, simple characters. So the first token could be A, the second C, G, T, you know, and we, we would have basically four tokens. Um, so we we do this um, we do this because we need to somehow, you know, uh, discretize the data for our model. 
then once we tokenize the, the tokenize the sequence, uh, we need to assign a number to each of these uh, tokens. So what we do, we just basically look at all the tokens we have and we will number them. Uh, it really doesn't matter in the order. What matters is that each different token has different number. And since deep learning models uh, uh, are doing uh, algebra, right? Uh, it doesn't make sense to make two uh, two different tokens, two different numbers close close to each other than some other two. So that means we have to get rid of this uh, proximity uh, among the tokens, uh, which is why we do something called one-hot encoding, uh, which is simply we will put these numbers into the vector and we will have uh, one on the position where the uh, where is the where the number is 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 uh, correct, right? So one would have one on the first position, three would have one on the third position. Uh, this uh, this allows the model to look at the data uh, in a way that doesn't uh, doesn't induce any proximity. So one and three are not uh, uh, further away than one and two in the one hot. So this is much better a representation of the data for our models. Uh, and we yesterday we, we were uh, doing uh, already doing something with the sequences. Uh, we were applying convolutional neural network uh, to the sequences. So what we did is we basically took something like you know ACTGA something some sequence like this maybe a longer, and we. Uh, we took some filters and we just went through the sequence, made our feature maps, and then flattened them and made classification based on these features. Um, and we, we could also just feed the sequences into our MLP, into the simple dense uh, neural network with dense layers. Uh, but uh, if, you, uh, if you think about it, these approaches have really significant disadvantages and are not quite sufficient for sequence uh, sequence analysis. And we will look at why. So first problem is how do we represent sequences of different length? Um, so the problem is when we would have something like a convolutional neural network, which, which has these filters, uh, we would have to have uh, basically all the sequences would have to have the same length. Uh, because when we apply the, the filters, we, we need to have some predetermined sizes of the feature maps. Uh, and we cannot just have one feature map bigger than the other. Let's say we have one sequence of length 100, second of length 200. And when we would apply the filter to these sequences, the feature map would have different sizes. Uh, and the neural networks cannot work with that. Neural networks are not. Uh, it basically the basic neural networks are not dynamic. They what we would what we usually do is we just specify the architecture before we start training and it stays like that. We don't have any more weights, we don't add any weights, we don't remove any weights from the network. We are just training the architecture as it is. Um, and this means that requires something, you know, something basically static input which uh, vari vari variable length sequences are not, right? Wh one uh, genomic sequence can have 100 characters, another 200. So convolutional neural networks cannot deal with this data. They just, you, you would have to do something like maybe uh, padding, you know, pad the, pad the shorter sequences. So they are uh, as long as the longest sequence, uh, which is not ideal. Right, it's uh, it could work, but it can also confuse the model. Uh, another that so that's one problem. That's, that's like the one of that. I think I think that's the biggest problem of the convolutional neural networks and the dense layer dense layer neural networks, the MLPs, uh, which is they cannot deal with these variable amps. Um, another problem is they are they cannot. Uh, easily capture long-term dependencies. And what this means is basically if we look at the filters, they are looking at, in this case, they are looking for uh, patterns that are in the range of three characters. Uh, but sometimes uh, it's important, this the first character or the first few characters 
can be very important for the meaning of the or for the interpretation of the last characters. If you think about, for example, simple natural language uh, sentence, you can you can say something. Uh, I went to the pool yesterday, uh, and the I uh, is very important for the whole sequence because it tells you who is the uh, about who is the whole sentence, right? And you, you can you know you can maybe search for the uh, for, for the for the person who is the sentence about. And if you have too long of a sequence and too little filters, you would have to do you know, a lot of work in the network to find some relationships. Uh, it would be much easier to have something uh, that can basically uh, know information about the whole sequence and then uh, project this information on demand. So these are the problems of the CNNs and the standard uh, standard dense networks and uh, we will show you uh, an architecture that partially solves these problems so uh, one of these architectures is called the recurrent neural networks and they uh, they are very interesting but also a little bit more complicated than the cnns so if you look at the image on the right side, on the left side, we would have, you know, something, uh, some classical, let's say it's a CNN. We would put the whole sequence as an input to the model. It would do some, you know, some processing, some computations, and at the end, it would give us the label. For example, is this, uh, is, is, it, is something true about this sequence? Yes or no. Um, and this doesn't allow us to have variable length sequences. So, uh, recurrent neural networks look at the sequence in a, a little bit of different way. Uh, we still have something like a layer in the middle, but what we are doing is we are feeding the sequence into the model uh, one token after each other. So let's say we have the ACTG sequence and the first input to the model would be the token A. So what would happen is we would have the token A uh, put it through the network and the network would give us, you know, uh, a guess if, if, if the thing is true about the sequence or not. So yes or no for the A. And that's not the only thing the recurrent neural network does. It will also take this output, basically this information, and it will feed it to itself for the next token. And what this means is we, we are basically every time we get a new token, we will get an information about the token, but we will also take in the co into consideration the information about the sequence so far. So what we think about it, we will feed it A, it knows nothing about the sequence so far because there was nothing before A, right? So it just predicts something. Then we will put inside the C. When we put inside the C, it will look at the C, and but it will also look at the information about the sequence so far. So, so far it saw something like A, so it will combine this knowledge and output another yes or no. Then after the C, we will feed it the token T. It will, you know, look at the T, consider what kind of token it is, uh, but also it will consider its knowledge from the previous step, which basically encapsulates what happened at the sequence uh, before the T. So we saw A and C and the network you know, kind of uh, made this information into some kind of a vector, into some kind of a information, which it then considers with some weights, combines these two knowledges and outputs another yes or no. And this way we can basically feed the network an infinitely long sequence. And for each token, it will give us prediction uh, what it thinks about the sequence so far. So. You know, when we feed A, we will get something. And when we feed it the whole sequence, ACTG, it will also give us some prediction. So it will go gradually uh, gather and it will gradually gather information about the sequence and update its prediction based on that. Uh, so this, you know, this uh, recurrent uh, arrow can be a little confusing. We can also imagine the recurrent neural network as unrolled version. So this on the right side is the same thing as if as the arrow image on the previous slide. Uh, the only difference is we now we have it unrolled. 
So at the beginning, we will feed it X0, which is the first token. We will feed it into the network. And we don't have any history. We don't have anything before the X0. So we will just feed it some, you know, some empty history vector. It will consider these two and output us some label. Then in the next step, we will get output of this, the, of the first prediction, basically the features on, on which the first token was decided. And we will feed it into the second part, which takes the second token as an input. And again, it will combine these two and output us another label. And we can do it you know, over and over again. Uh, so basically, if we unroll it like this, you could technically say we have infinitely long network if we have infinitely long sequence. Um, but the thing is, we are not, uh, we are sharing weights, which is an important part of recurrent neural networks. So this weight from the input to the network, it's the same for the first and for the second token and for the third token and so on. So the network, basically, this simple network has basically only three types of weights. It has the weights from the input. You can imagine it, you know, for example, as the dense layer or something. It has the weights on the output, and it has also the weights uh, which tell it, uh, it which information should it, you know, should it take from the previous step. So th this basically means we only have, you know, a finite number of weights, and as we teach the network what to do, the weights update uh, on all the places at the same time. And what we can do with this is, for example, simple sequence classification. So let's say we have a sequence and we have some kind of a label for it. Let's, let's take an example of natural language. Let's say we have uh, some kind of a database of movie reviews. Uh, which you know some people written maybe on some kind of online forum and they are uh, telling their uh, opinion about some movie and what we want to do is we want to classify whether the sentences sound positive or negative whether they like the movie or they didn't uh, so basically our training data set would look something like a sequence the whole sequence you know maybe a couple of sentences uh, about the movie and then either positive or negative uh, depending on what, how did the person rate the movie. Um, so how would we process this, this with a recurrent neural network? First, we would uh, separate the sentence into tokens. So in this, in this example, we would separate it, for example, for, uh, as uh, different words. We could also do, you know, simple characters and so on. But in this example, let's go with the words. So we would feed the neural network the first token, which is the. We would feed it inside. It has no memory vector so so far, so it would be empty. And based on the word the, you know, maybe that sounds uh, neutral or positive, so the network would output positive. Then this knowledge would get passed to the next step, and it would also see the next token, the token movie. And you know, the sentence still, based on the information so far, it still sounds positive. So we will output this, uh, feed it into the next, and the next word would be, you know, sucked. So that, that doesn't sound positive. So the network would basically update its label. Now it would start to think, hmm, maybe this uh, sentence starts to sound, you know, negative. So instead of positive, it would give us negative. And then it would be the last token, hard, the movies are hard. So it would take the information, combine it and it would say, all right, so the sentence is the whole, the whole sentence sounds negative and the last label would be negative. And if we want to classify the sequence, we would basically look at the last output of the network. So we would take the uh, label which the network outputs at the last step and we would consider it as its prediction uh, because it already saw the whole, the whole sequence. And we will do uh, something like this with uh, the quadruplex classification. So uh, let's go to GitHub, open the 08 uh, notebook, and we will look at how to do it in the code. All right, so what we will do is we will download our files. With, this is our data set, which contains the sequences and their labels. Uh, we have a little function here that just creates the data set for us. 
and we will load the training and testing set from the text files. And if we load it up this way, we will end up with something like this. We will just have, uh, we specified we want the batch size of 256. So we will have 256 examples in one batch. And each of them has two, a length of 200, which means the sequences have a length of 200 bases. And uh, also this dimension five, that just means the our one hot encoding. So this is how it looks. Each each of the characters basically looks like one in one of the places, right? The classic one hot encoding, and we have a bunch of them. So we have 256, which is our bridge size, 200, length of 200, and five because we have five positions for the one hot encoding. Um, and this is how our labels look for each of these sequences. We have either zero or one because uh, either the something is true about the sequence or not. Um, so this is how we pre-process our data uh, and we are ready to feed it to our model. So we need to specify the architecture of the model. And uh, if we want to do a recurrent neural network, uh, this is the simplest way to do it. You can do again a sequential model uh, and you will at this layer, which is called simple RNN. And you will put uh, a number here, which just means basically number of number of neurons in this layer. And then once we do this, we want to look at the last prediction and we will connect it with the dense layer of, let's say, size 50. Uh, yeah, we will maybe learn some weights there and then we will output uh, one number and make a prediction out of that. Uh, so, so far yesterday, what we were doing, uh, we usually had classification of multiple labels. So let's say the CIFAR, where we we're predicting the images of dog and airplane and so on, we had 10 labels. So our labels could be something like one, zero, one through nine. Uh, in this case, we only have zero and one, uh, which means we, we can only have one, basically one prediction number at the end of the network. Uh, we don't need to have two, we just need one, and zero will mean the class zero, and one will mean the class one. Um, and when we do this, uh, this is the difference from the when we have multiple, multiple classes. We don't actually want to have a softmax function at the end of the network, because we don't want to have the single number to be a probability vector, right? Because so what Softmax does, it will take, let's say, all these 10 numbers and make the probability vector out of them, which means they will sum up to one, well, basically 100%, right? And But if we only have one number and we apply this probability vector function to it, it's going to always be one, right? Because if you want to do probability vector out, out of only one number, it's going to output always one. Um, so we are not using so this is called binary classification where we are basically just having two labels zero or one uh, and instead of Z, instead of softmax at the end we will we will apply zigmoid uh, which basically uh, just squashes the number between zero and one and basically makes a probability out of this single number uh, but it doesn't make the whole vector probability vector. It it doesn't have to sum up to one. So it just it just basically squashes it into a probability. So that's why we are using activation zigmoid in the last letter. This is for the cases where you are having a binary classification problem with only two labels. Uh, so okay. that's our one model. Qu one question mm -hmm. from the chat, uh, mm -hmm. or two questions. Uh, first one yes. is the 64, you know, in line uh, where it says similar and 64, mm -hmm. mean that the net the network will look at 64 subsequent tokens? Uh, no. This, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, this only means the number of neurons in the letter. So I will go back to the slides to explain it a little bit better. Um, yeah, so let's look like at this slide. So. Uh, the 64 basically means uh, how many neurons are in this layer 
and this 60, let's say it's 64 for this example, these 64 numbers are getting passed to the output, right? So you can imagine it like a simple dense network. We have a hidden layer or a dense layer inside the network that has 64 neurons. Um, and the next, let's say it's a prediction layer, can make you know, have a weight from each of those numbers and take all of these features into consideration, learn the correct combinations, and learn how to predict the correct uh, label. And that's the that's that's the same in a recurrent neural network. You just have 64 neurons here, and those 64 numbers get passed to the next layer as well. And we also have some weights here, which can make combinations of these 64 numbers. Um, so the 64 only means uh, basically how big uh, how big how many numbers do you want to represent your history of your sequence? So the network will have opportunity to use all of these 64 numbers to, you know, maybe add or uh, remove some information or, you know, just make the different activations. Um, and th these 64 numbers get passed as a history to the next layer. So then the next layer will look at the input and it will look also at these 64 numbers and uh, you know, uh, somehow combine them with the input to make a next prediction. So it doesn't mean anything about the length of the sequence. It just means how many numbers are, how many neurons are we giving the network to work with? Um, okay. Yeah, and so I hope that makes sense. Um, okay, uh, there's another question saying, uh, um, is this task classifying 256 mers a zero or one or for some property. So I guess the question means if the, if, and you know, you can write on the chat if I'm not getting this right. Uh, the question is you have 256 characters, right? Uh, uh, so this, yeah, I will explain the 256. Okay. I, I suppose this means this 256. Yeah. So um, I will go through this again. The 256 is only batch size. So our whole data set has something like, you know, maybe 30,000 different sequences. So uh, I'm actually limiting it here just so it doesn't take too, too long. But let's imagine our data set is uh, 30,000 sequences. And each of these sequences can have a different length. Uh, for our example, they all have length of 200 characters. So we have, you know, 30,000 sequences and each of them has length of 200. And each of those 200 different letters are either A, C, T, G or N. And what the 256 means, uh, this is only a little, a little part of our data set. We are basically taking 256 out of these 30,000. And we are lo looking at them just, you know, how they look. Because what we do when we train the neural network, we are not giving it the full 30,000 at once. Uh, we are splitting them into batches, uh, which are smaller than the whole data set. So we are basically you know, splitting them into smaller chunks and then feeding the network with them. So here, the 256 just means we have decided to split the data set into uh, small batches of size 256. We still have only four characters uh, or five characters, A, C, T, G, and N. Um, yeah, so if that wasn't clear, just write in the chat and uh, I can go through okay. it again. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, let me see, there's more questions. <laughs> so one question is, uh, <laughs> if the RNN layer always has to come, have, has to come first, or could you start with a regular dense layer and then cover and then la layers afterwards to pass on a history that's more processed? Mm -hmm. I guess, yes. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, definitely. The RNN, complicated what, is only, what this was, means. Uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Uh -huh. Yeah, so let's go to the image again. Um, so the what the RNN only does it's basically only a simple layer that just passes the output to the next and it also takes basically uh, another vector uh, but yes it can you can also do different things before you actually feed it to the recurrent layer and 
what uh, uh, what is possible is basically you can this uh, instead of this you know x zero and feeding the one hot straight to the recurrent net layer, you can also have convolutional network here feed it for example a frame of a video and process this frame into a vector of features and then feed these features into the recurrent layer and you know make prediction out of that and pass it along so this way you would be actually able to process a video or you know a couple of frames after each other and make predictions out of that based on what's what is changing in the video which is a very interesting application so the answer is yes you can definitely process the input in a various ways before you feed it to the recurrent layer. Right. So we said that we are not going to really go into uh, more complicated architectures here uh, because it would it could be a whole other tutorial. But I believe uh, I've, what I've seen commonly for uh, for DNA is, for example, um, a few convolutional neural uh, uh, convolutional layers then a couple uh, uh, LSTM layers, right? So which are prepared. Uh, yeah, LSTM are uh, recurrent, just just right. so, so you know, and then, we didn't and talk then about the LSTM. Connected, yeah. And then the fully connected. So that they, you can mix and match basically in, in various ways. Uh, OK, OK, we can mm -hmm. continue, I think. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a note, you you still think about this, you know, the input can be just, you know, some features, uh, basically, to everything. You can give it features as you pre-process it before, you can give it features from some other neural network, it can be, you know, some combination of this. All right, so uh, let's continue. So where did we stop? We st stop at the model definition. So first we will put the recurrent layer, then we will just, you know, do some activations from the last prediction of this layer, uh, which is what the what does the recurrent net, neural network think at the very end of the sequence. And we will just make tense layers and we will make the sigmoid prediction because we have binary classification. And we also have a binary cross entropy loss because of this, uh, because of binary classification. Uh, we have the same old thing again. We will just fitting the model, let's say for 10 epochs. We can also do more, less, uh, whatever works. And we will fit the model with this data. So we will let it train. Let's look at the results. And we can see the results are not very, not very good <laughs> because uh, we have basically two classes, right? So if, if the model would guess randomly, it would have something about 50% accuracy, which is, you know, it's a little bit above that, but it, it doesn't really work. Uh, and we can ask, why is this? Why, why is this not working? It, it should, you know, it should maybe get at least some idea about the sequence. Um, and the answer is, it's not that much of a problem with the, um, network itself but more with the mechanism how the network learns uh, and we will look at something that uh, why it is this and what type of network it can be used instead of this so now we will talk a little bit about lstm uh, which is short for a uh, long short term memory and what what this basically means is we will add some mechanism uh, into the network, which will help us with this problem. And the problem is that when the sequence is too long, uh, the network will start to have some trouble with actually learning. So if you look at the unrolled, uh, unrolled network again, we can, you know, have this chain of uh, pass, chain where we pass the history vector to the next layer. And right now we have 200 uh, length sequences, right? A length of 200. So we have basically 200 of these layers after each other. Granted, they have the same weights, but it's still 200 layers. And uh, when we when we uh, want to teach the network something, it wants to learn something. Um, it's gonna go through the network, it's, and it's gonna look how does it want to update the weights. Uh, to make the prediction better. But when the network is so long, uh, it there is a lot of multiplications, basically. 
uh, we have, you know, we will multiplicate this and multiplicate this. And when we propagate the network, when we compute the gradient, uh, the gradient will be very small uh, or extremely big just because uh, we multiply so many times. So at the beginning of the network, this part uh, will basically have a very, uh, it, it will learn very slowly. It will, uh, it will not learn um, how to say it. Uh, it will contribute to the learning uh, much less than the later parts, uh, than the later tokens. So the network will basically uh, gradually forget what it saw at the beginning, and it will, it will, the later tokens will contribute more and more to the actual late, uh, latest prediction, uh, which is what we care about. Um, so this is the problem. The the learning basically gets slower and slower through the network and it gets harder and harder for the network uh, when the network is very long and what we can do with this is use something called lstm and uh, this mechanism uh, introduces uh, basically a new vector that we pass through the recurrent layers you know through the through the when we feed it one token it's gonna compute a new another vector and it's gonna pass it to another a layer and another as we go through the sequence and this little mechanism what it does it basically uh updates it makes like a new history vector but it updates it much more carefully it will look at what uh, what we did we what uh, of a new character did we receive it will look at the old history and it will basically not just combine these two in some kind of multiplication it will uh, decide what to uh, take from the uh, latest history in a smart way, what to add, maybe what to forget. And it will combine these things in a way that makes the learning much easier for the network when the sequences are very long. Um, this is, you don't have to understand too much about this mechanism. Uh, it's quite complicated. If you want to uh, learn a bit about it, it's called LSTM. You can find a lot of materials on YouTube that explain it quite well. Uh, we will not go through, you know, through all of this uh, daunting uh, uh, mechanism on the right side. Uh, just note it has a little more parameters um, and it makes the learning in the long uh, recurrent network much easier. Uh, but it's again, it's not important to understand it for practical purposes. Um, in practice, what is enough? I will show you. Uh, it's basically you will uh, replace the as we had the simple RNN at the beginning, right? And what you will do, you will just replace it with LSTM, which is it's already implemented in TensorFlow, uh, as you can guess. And you will just put LSTM instead of this. And everything else remains the same. And when we run the model, we can say we can see. Okay, so it kind of works. You know, at the beginning it had amazing something amazing like 90% accuracy, even on the validation set. Uh, but then it started doing uh, weird things. Uh, but we can see it has you know some kind of a potential, right? It works much better than 50%. Uh, and but I want to touch on this and basically uh, instability in the learning. Um, and this this has nothing to do with recurrent neural nets. This is in general when you see something like this in a, when training neural networks. Uh, this can mean something's wrong, right? Something's definitely wrong here. And it can be a problem with your data. It can be a problem with the network. Uh, but mostly when you see this kind of you know jumping up and down even on the training set. Uh, what you can do, you can try to adjust the learning rate, which is again, this is like extra, just the bonus information. This this is applicable not only to recurrent nets, but also to convolution nets, to uh, multi-layer perceptual nets, to everything. So what we did is we what we will do, we will basically uh, make the learning rate a little smaller. Uh, the default le learning rate in the network is uh, 0 0.001, and we will just uh, divide it by 10. Uh, so what this basically, why we are doing this is we are seeing the network, ideally, the at, le at least the training accuracy should still go up, right? Because that's what the tra that's what the training does. It makes the training accuracy high, or, or it should. And when it jumps like this, uh, 
it can mean you are updating the weights too fast. Basically, the learning is uh, it, the network is trying to learn with two big steps. And when it's doing that, you can adjust it a little bit with adjusting the learning rate to a lower number, which is what we are doing here. And when we run the network, uh, we can see the training is much more stable now. Uh, and yeah, so this is when you have this you know, unstability problem with the training accuracies, you can try to maybe lower the learning rate a little bit and it's, it's gonna, it should make the training uh, more stable, uh, but also a little bit slower but it's, it's worth it in this case. So let's look at the actual results now. Uh, we can see the validation and the testing training accuracy are very close to each other, and they are both around 90%, which is, uh, no, I don't know how complicated the data set is, uh, but 90% is pretty good for, uh, uh, you know, for two classes, right, from some G quadruplexes. It may not be the best, but we can see the network is actually learning from the sequences and classify them correctly most of the time. And so that's, that's uh, you can see this works much better than the simple recurrent neural networks. That's, and the only thing Master, we changed was- uh, can I, mm -hmm. There's one question that I think uh, it goes uh -huh, go on what you just said. Uh, are there any cases where a, a simple RNN would be preferable to an LSTM? Mm, that's an interesting question. Uh, right. I think in practice, in most problems, uh, uh, you are just throwing LSTM at the problem if you are using the recurrent nets. Uh, but there could be some simple problems that are, you know, maybe the LSTM is basically overkill for them. Um, I would, but I, would I think maybe if you don't have enough data and maybe using something that needs less parameters to be trained could be preferable but yeah i don't know i would yeah, try it, it can also learn a little yeah it can also learn maybe a little faster uh but or not I, i'm not sure about that if it has more or less parameters uh but if you are uh analyzing some kind of a data set like you know some complicated data like natural language or genomic sequences uh, usually uh, you are not using the simple recurrent net because of the problem uh, when the sequence is too long, the network will just have trouble learning. So it's not a problem in the, you know, in the architecture itself, uh, but in, in a way it is, but it's a problem with the learning. It's because you, it's, it's, it's better to have a network that is able to learn from long sequences than to have one that's not able to learn from long sequences, basically. So yeah. Uh, in practicality, you just you just throw LSTM at, at your program instead of the simple RNN. All right. Uh, so we can see it works much better, and we can also do a little adjustment to the LSTM, uh, which is called bidirectional LSTM. And this is this is again a little bonus. Uh, uh, this is, uh, you can sometimes use it in practice. In some problems it works, it sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but what it basically does is uh, we are going to have two recurrent nets, two LSTM nets. Uh, one that's going to analyze the sequence from the front. And the second that's going to analyze the sequence from the back. And then they are going to, you know, add output some vectors at the end. And we are just going to combine them combine the two knowledges when we analyze the sequence from the right and from the left and combine them into the out, the, out to the uh, output to the prediction basically um, so this is often used in uh, natural language processing uh, because when we are analyzing the sequence from the left we can you know maybe there's some information at the end that's very important uh, to the actual information at the beginning and the normal uh, recurrent layer or the normal LSTM layer cannot see that because it will not see the token until the very end. So sometimes what you do is you will basically have these two nets. Uh, one of them is analyzing the sequence from the front, the second from the back, and then they are going to combine their knowledge and output the probability. Uh, and it's very simple. You will. This is what we had before the LSTM, and you can just wrap it in a bidirectional layer. 
and it's going to work. And when we run this, uh, we can see it got a little unstable at the end, but in general, it has, uh, in the best case, if we stop here, let's say, it has, you know, somewhat comparable accuracy with the normal LSTM, maybe a little better, but it got a little while here. Maybe, maybe we need to lower the learning rate even more here. Um, so the bidirectional LSTM wasn't that useful in this case. It improved a little bit in some cases, but not by too much. So it's not always a good choice to just throw bidirectional LSTM at, at your data. Uh, but in some cases, it can actually help a lot to look at the data from the different uh, from the different uh, direction. All right. So this is this was the uh, recurrent neural network classification, uh, and we can actually do uh, another thing with recurrent neural nets, which is very interesting, and that's a sequence generation. So. Uh, we talked about how this sequence, uh, how is this sequence unrolled, right? We feed it one token, it's going to give us prediction. Um, and what we can do is we can, for example, let's take the example with natural language again. Let's have a sentence, uh, I need my medicine because something, something. And what we can do, we can actually tell the model to have uh, basically to try to predict the different label in each of those steps. And this label is going to be the next word. So this is a little complica more complicated than before. But what we are asking the model to do is we are showing him the word. And we are asking him, what do you think is the next word after this? And then we are going to give it the correct word. And it's going to you know, uh, compute the gradient and update the weights so it would, do, it would do a better job in this prediction. And then we're going to combine information and give it the new token. And we are going to give it the next word, which was the you know the the last predicted word. It should have predicted, and we're gonna give it uh, give it the word, and we're gonna ask it. Okay, so now you have the information what was before. You had I. Now you know the next word is need. So I need. What's the what's the next word? And you're gonna train the network like this. You are basically going to give it uh, ask the network to predict uh, the next word. So Remember, we did this thing, right? We did the classification. And we were only paying attention to the last prediction. At the very end of the sequence, we are looking what does the network think after the whole sequence. Now, we are doing something different. We are actually looking at all the labels, and each of them is different. And we are trying to teach the model to predict you know, the next word in general. So. We're going to try this on an interesting example, which is a generation of random text from Shakespeare. So we are going to uh, download all the novels from Shakespeare. We're going to train our recurrent, net, uh, recurrent neural network. And we're going to try to uh, let it generate us some text. And we're going to see how it looks. So this is another new notebook. This is the notebook on GitHub, uh, numbered 09, RNN generation. So let's jump into that one. Um, all right, so again, we have to get our data. So the TensorFlow actually contains this. Uh, it has uh, the, the, the whole Shakespeare data set in their API. So we can download it uh, in this one line code. And we'll start to look at the data, how it looks. So if we open the file, and we'll look at it, and we will look at how many uh, characters there are. Uh, we can see it's over 1 million characters. So Shakespeare wrote a lot of stuff. So we, we have a lot of characters to work with. Uh, and we can look at how it looks. Let's look at the first 250 characters. And here we can see first citizen enter before we proceed. Any further, hear me speak, and so on and so on. So we can see this is this is our data. We have basically the sentences, uh, you know, maybe enters if the Shakespeare uh, made a space after that, and go on and, and so on, so on. Um, and what we can do is we can look at how many how many different characters is he using because we will want to tokenize it, right? 
So maybe he's using some special characters. We'll have to, we don't have, we don't know how many there are. It's not like ACPGN uh, in the genomic sequences in the natural language or in the Shakespeare language. Uh, we don't know which characters is he using. So we'll have to look at it. And if we make a set out of it and we'll look at how many, how many different characters there are, we can see the different characters here. And we can see, you know, see, using some, maybe some dots, maybe some hyphens, and then the alphabet, right? So capital letters and also lowercase letters. So this in our network at the beginning, these are going to be different tokens because the network is not going to uh, predict, you know, it's, it's going to actually try to predict whether the uh, letter is capital or not too. So we, we're just not, not going to be asking it to predict us some text. We're going to be asking it to predict us the correctly capitalized text too. So we just have, you know, a bunch of tokens. These are going to be our alphabet. And we will make a function that's going to numericalize this sequence. So we will assign a number to each of these tokens. Uh, we can do it with a TensorFlow function called string lookup. Uh, which we're going to give it our vocab, uh, vocabulary, and it's going to give us this uh, function that's going to help us to numericalize the data. So when we, for example, give it the text hi mom, uh, we're going to give some, we're going to get uh, out something like this 21, 48, 2, blah, blah, blah. And these are basically numbers that correspond to these uh, characters. So 21 is H, 48 is I, and so on. So we have a function that's going to numericalize this. Uh, we can also make the inversion to basically decode what the network does. So if we give it these numbers, we're going to get a high mom out of it back, which is what we want, right? Um, so now we have this big chunk of data. We have these million characters, and we have a way to make the tokens out of them. So let's create the data set out of this. Uh, we will convert them to the tokens. So we will take the complete text and pass it to the function that numericalizes it. And what we're going to get is array of, you know, over 1 million numbers and the numbers start with 19, 14 and so on. So that looks, that looks good. Uh, then what we're going to do is we are going to split this uh, long, basically this million. This is a sequence that has a length of a million, right? So we, we could we could theoretically pass the whole sequence to our recurrent neural network. And you can actually try it if you want. Um, but what we're going to do, we want to speed up the train. And we don't want the sequences to be you know, so maybe some extra long. And we want them to uh, have the same length because we want to make them into batches. So uh, if you remember, I said sequences don't have to be the same length when uh, applying it to the uh, recurrent neural network, uh, which is true. The sequences don't have to be the same length, but usually when you are training the network, uh, you want to have the batches, let's say 32, you know, sequences in one batch. And uh, it's it's a nice thing to have them the same length because then you can, you know, you can pass it to an array and you can store it in the memory of the computer quite well. Uh, you will not have any uh, maybe memory problems, you know, because if you have like a array that's different, has different length in different dimensions, it's it's quite it can be problematic. So for our sake, we are going to split the million length text into sequences of 100 uh, characters, and we're gonna uh, teach the network to predict, you know, uh, basically the next next letter based on these 100 length sequences. Uh, that said, we are training on sequences of length 100, but when we will be uh, predicting something uh, with the trained model, we will still have the option to give it as long as of a sequence we want. So that's going to be fine in practice. We, we, we will not be stuck with the 100 when the model is trained. We, we can still feed it, you know, different lengths after. So that's fine. Um, so what we will do is we will, uh, uh, we will batch, we will batch these sequences uh, into sequences of length 100. Uh, and if we look at one of these batches uh, on one of these examples, uh, we will have, you know, 100 numbers, which is 
the red number we want, right? We want 100 uh, characters after each other, and that's going to be our one example. Uh, so that's it. And we have this, uh, you know, this sequence, uh, but we also need the label, right? We need to do, we need the network to know what is the label and the label is going to be always the next character. Uh, so in the slides example, we had the next word. In this example, we are predicting the next letter. Uh, so we will do a simple function that's going to make us the labels from the, uh, from the sequences. So if you look at this, you know, first citizen, blah, 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 we will just shift it by one character. So when the network receives the token F, it's going to, it's going to, we will want it to predict the I because that's, that's the correct next character. Then we will give it I and it's going to try to predict the num the uh, letter R because that's the next character and so on. So that's why we are shifting this by one character because we are basically creating the label for the model. Uh, and just like extra bonus information, this is called uh, semi-supervised learning. So when we when we we don't actually have a labels right in our data set, we are creating the labels from data itself, uh, which is called semi-supervised learning. It's still supervised. We still have labels, uh, but we are creating them from the data itself. So that's that's the difference. Uh, all right, so we have our data, we have our labels, we have them split into sequences of length 100. Uh, we can make a data set out of them. Uh, we will make them batch sizes of 64. Um, and at this point, we have the TensorFlow data set. We are ready to train the model. So we need to specify the model architecture. Um, and here you can see this is a little bit more complicated definition than before, uh, but it's only because we are um, doing some kind of, uh, you know, sequence generation prediction. Uh, and this is just, you know, a, a little custom code to make the predictions easier. Uh, if you are training the model, you don't have to do it this complicated. Uh, you can only, you can always do this. This is how you would define the model in a simple way. You know, just, we will just one hot, the numbers, we will pass it to the simple RNN and we will make some dense. Uh, we will have uh, 66 different uh, possible classes because we have 66 uh, different uh, letters that can be predicted. And we will do softmax on that. So don't worry about this too much. This is basically the network, just uh, one hot encoding layer followed by simple recurrent neural network followed by the classification layer. Um, so we'll again train the model. Let's fit it to the training data set and we will train it. And we can see the testing accuracy goes up, 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 up to the 50%. And now this is the code for the text generation. Again, you don't have to worry about this. The important thing is you can call generate Shakespeare on your model and tell it how many characters you want. And you can also give it some starting string. So if you try to generate 400 sequences from this basic recurrent neural network without LSTM, uh, it will give us this <laughs> id blank um, and some gibberish. So we can see it, it. The network learned a few things. It learned to you have to put uh, you know enter after a few characters. It learned to uh, correctly generate someone who is speaking in caps lock. And the rest is in normal uh, normal size, and it learned to capitalize, you know, the first letters, and maybe it may it it gets some English words right. Um, so this is what we get from the basic recurrent neural network, and let's try to improve it with LSTM. Um, and we'll also do another improvement, which is called embedding layer. So remember, as we said, we have the, you know, the tokenization, we have it, the numericalization, and then one hot encoding. Um, and if you remember, we, our tokens uh, had uh, contained the capital letters, but also the lowercase letters. For example, big A and small A, capital A and, and uh, lowercase A. Um, and when we one hot encode these, 
they will you know they will not have any relationship right because they will own have their own little one in a different position um so we kind of got rid of the proximity here right from the numericalization we basically had you know false proximity because two is not closer to the four than to the five because these are just you know randomly selected basically just them to be unique that's important we will put them to one hop so they have no proximity at all uh, but maybe we actually have some tokens that are similar to each other, right? Maybe the lowercase a and uppercase a, they, are, they mean the same thing, but they are a little different, right? So they are much more similar to each other than, for example, a to g. So what we can do is uh, we can introduce something called embedding layer, which is basically going to take these numbers and it's going to learn through training. So it's a part of the deep neural network. And it's going to learn to basically reduce the dimension into something like this. It's going to put the numbers into some dimension. Let's say this is three numbers, right? So dimension three. Um, and we, the network will learn uh, to represent the numbers in a way that the similar tokens are closer to each other. Uh, you could you could theoretically do the same thing with some kind of a dense layer, uh, but you would not have the guarantee of you know working it so well. It's it's but if you want if your aim is to introduce some smart proximity between the tokens, uh, you uh, you will mostly use embedding layer. So let's see how it works. Again, this is a complicated version because of prediction. And this is going to be the simple one. So the simple definition. It's basically at the beginning of the model, we will introduce our embedding layer. Uh, the first number just means the number of our tokens, uh, because our to we have 66 tokens, you know, the alphabet plus maybe some numbers and hyphens and so on. Uh, so we, we figured out at the beginning we have 66 different tokens. And the second number just means how big of an embedding uh, dimension we want. So at this example, we had three right three numbers and here we are saying all right so you will have 256 numbers to work with um so once we have the embedding this is basically instead of one hot encoding the embedding layer can work even if you don't have the one hot encoding layer that's the amazing part about embedding layer it can you know actually do the computations smart way you don't have to one hot encode before the embedding layer it will kind of look at the numbers as if a as if they were one hot encoded so that's that's a good thing for us it's less work so we can just put with uh, instead of one hot encoding we will just you know have the numericalized data set and we will just put an embedding layer at the beginning uh, then we can do the classic lstm layer and the dense layer with the prediction with the softmax um, and we can train it and when we train it, we can see uh, the simple RDN model, I believe, had accuracy about 50%. This one reaches up to 77. So let's see if it generates a little better text. We'll ask it to generate as Shakespeare, again, 400 characters. Um, and you know, it still doesn't look that good, uh, but it looks quite better than the simple RNN model. Uh, it, it, you still have words that doesn't make sense, but Maybe it starts to you know uh, introduce some verbs and so on, um, but yeah, it's it's pretty hard to you know evaluate this kind of thing, right? Because uh, you you will you kind of have to look at it and see if it makes sense or not, and hopefully it's going to be good. But this is just a fun example that uh, shows you that you can actually train a model uh, that can generate you sequences. And, and uh, the way you do it is you will be using recurrent neural networks uh, and you're going to ask it to predict you the next token. And you can basically chain these things. You can give it, you know, Romeo at the beginning, ask it to give you the next token and it will give it the next token as another input. And you're going to repeat it and basically it's going to generate you text. Um, yeah, so that's about that's all about the sequence generation. And uh, I believe now we will have a coffee break. So let's check out the time. It's um, for us, it's 1427. So 1437, this is 
CET, but UTC, let me check. Um, yeah, so it's going to be 12. All right, so see you in 10 minutes. So okay. that's better now, yep. So, so now I will give like very short intro and, and David will continue. Uh, so we will speak about the interpretability of neural network. Uh, the first question is why do we need it? And why do we need it so desperately, especially in the biology and uh, biological and medical research? And the reason is the trust of the stakeholders, because if you just train the neural network and you said, okay, my neural network is working with this accuracy, uh, the, your fellow researcher might think, yeah, you know, do I really need so high accuracy? Wouldn't that, I be better with something that is, you know, smaller, simpler, and something I can understand and control? And, and those are not like the stupid questions. Th those are actually excellent questions because we have all have seen neural networks that uh, that uh, uh, had excellent metrics but didn't really work. And like, why is that like possible? Is that uh, what we have talked before that the neural network could be picking signal that is not real and is, uh, is, is some artifact? Like, I don't know, in, in one of the paper I have seen, uh, there were like um, a DNA uh, sequence uh, classifier between like several classes. And when we then look, uh, they have like very different uh, like composition of, uh, of CG percentage between the controls and, uh, uh, and and what they were trying to recognize. So neural network clearly picking like this is a signal. Uh, another thing could be like those N as uh, Panos talked about. You know, it could be a lot of things. It's, it's, it's like really helpful if we can get some insight like what the neural network is really doing to, to avoid the biases in the training data. Uh, also, quite often the, the target is to understand the biological process, not only do the classification. Uh, it has been also proved that like uh, the best combination is usually attained by some collaboration between the human and the computer. But the human needs like uh, some some help, it, like if 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 the computer say, okay, this seems to be like the cancer tissue, it's it's much better it, it, if it can uh, like pinpoint the part of the image uh, that that mostly like led him to this conclusion. And also like, you know, if, if your model was working on like one data set or it was working yesterday and it's not working today or not, it's not working on another data set, like if you have some insight, like how the decisions are being made, it's it's very helpful. Uh, David, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the YouTube video that appeared like literally three days ago or four days ago, uh, made by Google about the interpretable machine learning methods. Uh, and uh, why I Put it here is I think it's 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 pretty good uh, it's a pretty good classification of the method. So we will be talking mostly about the post hoc, so that you like train the model, and after training, you are trying to uh, to do some interpretability. And you basically can do it on two levels. You can do it on the individual prediction level. That that means like you've got the uh, your image and you are trying to like highlight the, the parts of the images that led to the decision. Or you can do some summarization over like all the data set. And it could be like, imagine that you are doing the DNA and you are interested in, like which position uh, influence mostly like uh, uh, the overall decision, so you can find that, I don't know, the, the, the first, second, and third position are the most important and rest not so much. And specifically, we will be talking here about the integrated gradients, and we will do it in a minute. Uh, can you continue, David? Oh, sorry. All right, so, uh, let's continue. 
So right now we know uh, why do we want to interpret uh, neural networks? Why do we want to know what are they doing? And we will look at a uh, few methods that will tell us uh, these methods are like examples of how, how we can do it. So as uh, we will see uh, later, each of those methods uh, kind of care about the different part of the neural network. Uh, we will use uh, CNN network as an example. And uh, as we will see some methods, for example, care about uh, the convolutional layers. Some methods are trying to visualize the filters and so on. So we will have a look at it right now. Uh, so if we uh, remember how we were uh, talking about filters in convolutional networks, um, those we can also visualize. So if we have an image the, and we use the filter on the image, it gives us changed image and highlights the feature that the filter cares about. Uh, and this output that we get after applying uh, the filter is called a feature map. And so the filters actually hold a, an important uh, idea about what the network is looking for. So in the first layer, in the first convolution layer, we can uh, easily understand those filters because as was told before, those are generally uh, lines or they are looking, the filters are looking for lines, horizontal, vertical, diagonal, corners, or maybe some uh, spaces with the same color or something like that. So uh, the meaning is simple, we can understand it. But when we move to uh, further layers in the network, it uh, gets a bit difficult to understand them because also uh, they get uh, more complex. Uh, so we'll see these uh, layers in the la uh, these filters in the layer two. Uh, they are seven by seven, which is already a bit hard to visualize because it's quite small. And uh, there is a lot, a lot of them, and they contain like the connections uh, or not connections, but like combinations of the uh, uh, features from before. So they get more specific to the class, for example. We'll see uh, examples soon. So uh, one method was uh, visualizing the filters. It can tell us what is the uh, network looking for, but it doesn't explain the decision on a specific uh, image, for example. Um, now it's important to uh, uh, remind what uh, were gradients, because uh, we will uh, talk about them uh, in connection to our uh, further methods. So if you remember, uh, yesterday we were talking about them. And basically, a gradient is a number for each weight that, if we subtract, it uh, helps us. So weight meaning a parameter. So for example, in this uh, simple example, we have the output, the x as an input, and m and b are parameters that, if we change, we, change, uh, we can uh, influence uh, the prediction of the function. And um, if we imagine a function in more dimensions with more parameters, uh, also, for example, called weights in neural networks, then the gradient will be a vector uh, and each position in the vector will be a number that is a suggestion how we should change the function, uh, its parameters uh, to maximize or minimize the function, uh, the output, uh, sorry, the error and don't worry about it too much. It's just important to have the basic idea. So basically, gradients are uh, are telling us to um, how each individual parameter is influencing the final output of the prediction in a way. Uh, don't worry to interrupt with the questions uh, with questions if you have during so. Uh, now we will move to another method that 
uh, it's called saliency maps and uh, saliency maps are actually the, the outcome of this method. So basically saliency maps are uh, like um, saliency maps, they give a value to each pixel. So for example, we can, we can see we have some input and we want to know how uh, or what pixels are important in this input for our neural network uh, to make the prediction dog. And the saliency map is the output. And there are different ways how we can uh, get our saliency maps. So how we can uh, get this uh, visualization of uh, the importance of the pixels. These highlighted pixels are what was important for the network to make the prediction of a dog for this image. And the way how we do it here is that it's different than visualizing the filters. We have now have a specific input. So we want to know for this image. And so given this image and the, the class label of a dog, so we have to know that we are, the network should be looking for a dog. Um, we uh, calculate the, we, we, we put the input into the network and then we get the outputs. And we will have a look at uh, how the each pixel is influencing our prediction, specific prediction of a dog. And we can get this by computing the gradients. Uh, so we compute the gradients of the predicted class score with respect to the pixels of the input image. And so, so basically let's uh, have a um, look at uh, how this could be useful. So for example, if we are, have a network that is learned to uh, predict if uh, the image that we put is cancerous or not. So uh, this is an example of a prostate cancer. So does it contain a prostate cancer or not? And the network will tell us yes or no. It doesn't really tell us much. For example, the image A is healthy and the others are not, All right? But uh, the network, yeah, as Peter said, we kind of need an explanation because we, we, we have difficulties of trusting a network, for example, when are talking about health issues, right? So that's why, why where we can use saliency map, for example, to tell us which uh, pixel of the network is was important for the decision. So there is an image where the decision was uh, that it contains cancer, and uh, the green values are the values that influenced the network to make the decision towards positive, towards containing cancer. The blue values are what a medical specialist annotated as a, the this part of uh, image contain a cancerous patterns. So uh, there is, for example, an application that uh, we can help the medical specialists. Uh, we can faster, faster make their job faster by for example, highlighting these areas that are suspicious for the network, and then the professional can have a look and say, all right, it's suspicious, I agree. Uh, we should continue with some other examination. Um, another application of the saliency maps could be that, uh, could be for image segmentation. So. As uh, we see in the picture on the left, the saliency map that we get is uh, if it if the network works correctly, is actually uh, highlighting the pictures that contain the class because those are important for the network to say that that's the class. So if we uh, overlay the saliency map over the picture, we can see that it can kind of segment the class. And uh, this is quite powerful because usually uh, segmentation is done on a training or like we, we use a training data set that has this 
what we can see on the right. So all the cars and trees, they are annotated. And this is how we teach the network what, what is a correct segmentation. But for the saliency maps that are produced here, we didn't need this. We just looked at why the network thinks that is uh, that the, that it was this class. Um, David, the problem is that yeah, I perhaps. think that um, uh, might be interesting. So the question is that since no no one individual pixel will cause a classification error, how do you measure the saliency pixel per pixel? I'm not sure if I understand the question well. Could you repeat, please? So basically, please. The, the, the question is that, um, like, to calculate the saliency, um, you, uh, per pixel, as you saw in the second column, right, uh, there's a score per, per pixel. But uh, uh, changing one pixel of the, of the image would not uh, classify this image, you know, not as a bird anymore, right? Um, so how, how exactly does this uh, score, this saliency um, get, get uh, you know, how, how do you calculate this uh, score, basically, this saliency score? Yeah, all right. Yeah, I, I understand. All right. So um, let me think about how to say it uh, well. So I can actually return to a slide that I didn't want to show before because, well, salient, computing these saliency maps has to do a lot with computing the gradient. And this, when we get to this, it becomes too mathematically complicated. But basically, if we get back to example with uh, the digits, uh, handwritten digits, if uh, we input the digit into the network, then uh, the inputs, they excite some neurons in the network. So they uh, increase the, the value in the neurons and that because the neurons have found some uh, feature there. And then this happens also for the next layer. So some neurons from the previous layer excite some neurons in the next layer. And then when we get to the output, it should excite the correct neuron in the output layer, the neuron that has for example, uh, with softmax, the neuron that has the that is the closest to one uh, as a prediction, so one being like one hundred percent sure that it's this class uh, is the uh, pre is, is the predictive class, so the highest highest output output. And uh, basically, how do we uh, compute the saliency map? Is that uh, for example, here, if we take the, in, the neurons that are white as the one that were excited and zero as the predicted class, which is not correct, but whatever, uh, we want to know why it decided like this. So we can uh, start from the zero and we see, all right, these neurons were excited. What, why these neurons were excited? Because some of those neurons excite, excited them and why some of these neurons were excited because of the inputs. So um, we just get a highlight of uh, the pixels from the input that were contributing to the classification of the class as zero, for example, here. But yes, of course, if we change some of just one of these neuron, uh, sorry, neuron, one of these inputs that was important, if we uh, just a little bit or just one of them, it will probably decrease our confidence in the classification. But of, of course, one pixel will not or should not probably change from, from zero to one, for example. But a bunch of them could. I hope I answered it. Uh, let me know if. Yeah, I think not. that. Uh... So basically, it's working backwards through the through the uh, network to network. right. Okay. Yeah, I think um, I think that's fine. And another question is, um, what what is the third column in the in that uh, yeah in that slide? If you click, 
like what's there you know the red and blue yes, colors so uh, those are just the overlays. Uh, so this is where we took the saliency map and we, so the saliency map is in the second column and we just uh, put it over the images, I believe. And so so it's just another visualization of the saliency map. Oh no, I'm, I'm wrong. It's it's just another visualization of the saliency map. I think it's map just a different color clicks. scheme. It's just a different color yeah, scheme. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. That That's probably that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yep. That's fine. Right. Thanks for the questions. So this was the salience map, and now we will have a look at integrated gradients, which actually they uh, integrated gradients is a method that produces a similar picture as we will see. So it also highlights uh, some uh, pixels of the uh, input image. But uh, the method how we calculate it is a bit different. And so the how we get to the to the result is that we have again we have the input, so it's all another animal, and we have we take some image that is not informative, like it doesn't contain any information, which of course is a very vague definition, but uh, that's also a problem of this method that we will talk about later. So let's take a black image. And we put this image into the network. And we uh, calculate the saliency map as before. So we look at the output. How is What is this black image classified as? Or actually, uh, why would the network think that this image is a dog? Because we also use the, the class. Uh, label, and then we uh, we save the result, and we go again. We now we change this black image uh, a little bit to the actual image, so we actually make like an interpolation. If I'm using the right word, so we we make like a create like a step by steps changes of the pixels to get in here. Uh, this is made through. Uh, Uh, in integration, I believe, and uh, mathematics is a bit complicated, but that's uh, the notion of how we do it. So we put this image that is on the spectrum of those two images, but it's closer to the black. We again put it into the network. We ask the network why you would think this is a dog. It highlights some images for us, and we save the result. And we do this for every step. So here are three steps, but in practice, we would use for example, 50. The more we use, the more it should be precise, probably. And then we have, so here it's like five images. So we would have five results, five, five highlighted maps of the pixels. And we just uh, average those, I believe. And what it results in that actually the map looks a bit better. So the highlight of the images is a little bit nicer and more precise. So we are basically looking for uh, what is if we say this is a panda and this is a panda. Like what is the what is the differences in the network behavior and the classification of those images as a panda? And uh, here we see it compared with the method that we saw before. So with the grad at the image, just one image. Those were the saliency maps also. But they are all like saliency maps because that's only the uh, definition of uh, having highlighted pixels. So these are the integrated gradients. And we can see that the, uh, the, the map, the highlighted pixels are much more uh, nicer, let's say. And I believe now we will move to a demo. So uh, let me give the word to Peter, and he will show us a demo of the integrated gradients. Okay. Okay. So let's have a look. Um, so I'll probably need to share the screen. 
And again, go to the bit ly eccb 21, and we will be doing the demo number 10, integrated gradients. Nice. Um, okay, I have too many sessions. No, oh, no, run it anyway. And I have too many sessions, so I need to terminate my previous previous one. And I hope now it will be working. Good. So uh, we will be working with the G quadruplexes, the same data set as, before, as, as yesterday. And actually what I have here in the data part was just copied from yesterday. So I will not comment about it too much. So I'm creating one hot encoded train data set. It's taking some time, but should not be like super long. And I am creating the convolution neural network. Uh, that is that is not what we have seen yesterday. This is actually adapted from uh, from the paper that we've published about this data set, I believe last year. Uh, so it's slightly more complex and I wanted to show it to here because it's like more like, uh, um, high quality neural network. So you can see that that I am not having like one con convolution layer. I have like several convolution layers here. One, two, three. I believe in original paper it's even more, but but here I put three convolution layers, and like I have like thirty-two filters here, and, and gradually I am going down. I'm doing the max pooling. I believe that's the same as like yesterday. And then you can see here something that we didn't really talk on, on this workshop, but but can somehow help you a lot when you see overtraining and, and numerical instability and that's batch normalization. Uh, it's, it's basically mean that when the batch is coming through, it's subtracted from all the points. Uh, their average and divided by standard deviation. It's it's basically some something to 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 have better numeric stability. Okay, and then we are doing dropout. That's something you know from yesterday. And at the end of the day, we are doing like global average pooling, and that's it. And we are classifying into two classes. So at the end, is one neuron that is trying to predict whether it's rather class one or class two. And we need to compile the model. Nice. And yeah, here I'm actually doing the splitting across the data set. I'm fitting just for three epochs because the model is, is a bit larger than yesterday. Uh, I'm training on the GPU, so so initially it's taking some time to set up the GPU properly, but then it will like work, I hope much faster. <clears throat> okay, now it's running. And you can see like the, that almost from the beginning, I'm on accuracy 83, which is like pretty sweet, 84. No, oh, it's running slightly slower than then in the morning, I don't know why. Okay, so even after the first epoch, my validation accuracy is 92%. Here you can like, uh, like observe, this is one of a few cases when the validation accuracy is higher than the training accuracy. And the reason is that the training accuracy is calculated as the model goes. So with every like, iteration while the validation accuracy is basically tra uh, trained uh, is, is uh, estimated like after that so so the model already have seen more data although it, it's clearly like that it's a bit unstable because like it dropped down oh that's that's very bad okay if something like that happens sometimes it's, it's good like to do uh, slow 
to get the lower the learning rate and maybe like increase the number of the epochs. So that's what I'm going to do here. So let's do TF cross optimizers. So here I'm specifying the optimizer. And when you specify the optimizer, you can like set the learning rate. So I will go a bit lower than it was. And, you know, we can add extra to FOX and we will see what will happen. <clears throat> like, um, guessing the correct learning rate uh, when the default le learning rate isn't working for you is, is kind of hard. There are the... Um, there are the ways how to do that uh, implemented originally in the fast AI package, but now I have seen that it has been like ported into TensorFlow as well. Um, we will see. So, so initially we are having like pretty high learning rate. So, so another possibility would be not to uh, increase the number. One of the question apostles. means uh, why isn't there a sigmoid at the end of the dense? Uh, that you know the. There's no sigmoid at the end. Oh, is that my, my like? <laughs> <laughs> that uh, I'm no, I think, where do I have it? Um, where is my, like, um, the, the way is, I'm using the binary cross entropy matrix, so, uh, I can touch on it, Peter, if you okay. don't mind. No, 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 yep. I'm quite the opposite. Is, mm -hmm. is it yeah, so from, from logit, if, if I don't specify it? can be, yes. when, So the, the thing is, when you are specifying a network and you have the last layer, um, you, you can do two things. One, you can, if you, let's say you have the binary classification problem, right? Mm -hmm. One, you can apply uh, the zigmoid, right, to the last layer, and then have binary cross uh, and you would define it like tf dot maybe losses dot binary cross entropy and you would specify that class mm -hmm. or you could do the same thing and don't apply the sigmoid in the last layer and specify a parameter of the binary cross entropy that says from logits equals to true and what that does it basically applies the correct activation function for you so if you would have for example last layer if you would use a uh, multi-class cross entropy, it would apply softplex. If you would apply binary cross entropy, it would, it would apply sigmoid. So it, you can basically leave the correct activation function for the loss. And I believe when you specify the loss with this string, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it can may, maybe that, you know, it tells the uh, TensorFlow, so it, it will apply it for you basically. Yeah. But, but Honestly, like, like this is a very good question and it would be better probably to put it there explicitly. So you can always like, it's the same as the optimizer. I've put it, I, originally it was the Adam or you can like really put there the function TF Keras optimizers Adam. And here it's it's the same thing, TF Kera uh, or uh, can you help me? Is it is it loss, losses? And uh, yes, something something like that. Yeah, it's some, usually if you are not sure about what it what it, it's doing, just you know put the class there and look into the parameters yeah. of that class, uh, and there you in documentation you will find you know what what parameters does it have. Yeah. So like th this might be, you know, a bit more readable. Like this. Okay. Yeah, but. In, if in documentation, if there is from logits false, then the comment is correct and you should have the sigmoid in the last uh -huh. layer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's still like kind of strange that it's working so good if, if it was wrong, but yeah, whatever. Um, okay, uh, another thing that I wanted to show is uh, how to save the model. Uh, we have touched it with the TensorFlow.js, like uh, if for imagine that this was not done in, in those uh, less than two minutes, but you have been training it for several hours or days. 
uh, especially if it's days, it's, it's good like to save the <laughs> Uh, the model uh, in the middle because like it, it happened even to me that you that I was training on the cloud the model for five days and then it crashed and I, I like lose all the work because I have no saved uh, results in the middle so so it's always good like to, to save your model it could be saved to, to one h5 file or, or to folder with several file and if it's saved you can like always load it and, and don't, you don't have to train it again. Okay, so uh, we have touched about how the integrated gradient is working, that it's like trying to overcome the separation, separated gradient problem. So it's like walking you around the path from some like baseline image or, uh, or uh, you know, zero, uh, Zero, um, zero sequence. So uh, I will not like, I have some functions that are prepared here and I will not go through all of them, but probably just go to the, like how, how it worked. So you, pro you provide a sequence, uh, you one hot coded the sequence. So that's what we have. And like after that, uh, you will, like, like this is, oh, Jesus, I did something wrong. Why is it? No, oh, because I forgot to run this cell. Sorry. I don't have to like walk you through, but I still need to run it. Okay. And now like what's, what's useful here is that you can see uh, like, um, like this is your sequence. This is what we have classified. Uh, uh, the uh, the sequence was classified as as G for quadruplex, and the highlighted letters are what like led to the decision. So if it's red, it uh, it means that it's uh, like influence it uh, positively. So influence it to the G for quadruplex. So we can see that you you know. This is, this is making very much sense because we have like four G letters in a row. So it's like, or here's three G letters in a row. So it's no surprise that this, this is like the parts of the sequence that like uh, led to the decision that yes, this is G quadruplex. And on the other hand side here is the T that is like, you know, that is ending this um, GG GG sequence. So it, it, it was like uh, contradicting that, that it would be like G4 quadruplex sequence. And here is like another T that I don't know why it was so important. Uh, but, but basically like this is the thing. So, so you can see not only like the decision, but you can see like what led to the decision. And this is probably all what I wanted to show here. David, could you continue? Yes, all right. So, yeah, I need to start sharing. Okay. So, this was an example of integrated gradients. And now we will look at another method. So, uh, the method is GradCam. Uh, the, the CAM stands for Class Activation Mapping or MAP, I believe. And the GRAD stands for Gradient. And uh, this answers the question once again. So why do we need model interpretability? And GradCam says to make cool animations. So GradCam is another popular technique to visualize, but this is very specific, or this is only for convolutional neural networks or networks that have some convolutional layer. So we will be looking here. Here we have again our network and input at the bottom, output at the top, and we will be looking at the last convolutional layer here. And the reason why we will be looking here is that we expect that the last convolutional layer have um, high level uh, semantics or high level uh, information about 
the shapes in our image. So as we were talking about the filters in the first layer, for example, these are some basic, so here, first layer, these are some basic um, shapes. But as we progress and as we get to the last, those are more specific to our class and more complex. So uh, let's uh, continue. Um, so uh, actually, as we were talking before for also the other methods, sorry, um, we always needed the class label. So we always needed a picture, for example, here, a picture of a dog and a cat, and the class label of uh, what do we want to explain. So we want to explain the prediction that this is a cat, or we want to explain the prediction that this is a dog, and that this tells us where do we start from our uh, computation of the method. So we start from the output, as we've seen. And uh, if we say we want a dog, we start from the output that tells us it's a dog. And I believe there were also some questions, or we, we talked about maybe in the chat yesterday, that um, if there are like more classifications into more classes. So uh, here it's the network is still, or the network that we will show, it still classifies just one class. So for example, if you were training on this image, it would be a very bad training image because it has dog and cat. And if both are our classes, we don't, we shouldn't use it. But if we only had the part with the dog, uh, we would just want it to classify the dog, not the window, for example, also. But um, because the last layer, uh, we use softmax in our examples uh, that tells us the probability that it's the class so as we can see in the first column here it's 100 percent sure that it's the class at position six but in the second output it would be uncertain if uh, okay is this the fi fifth or is it the sixth so if we look at for example the top two or top three uh, numbers here the highest numbers in the prediction we see what uh, classes does it think it, it, it the input is? Well, anyway, uh, back to GradCam. So, um, so remember we were visualizing the filters, right? Once more, uh, I'm showing it here again because of the feature map. So, as we said, if we have an image and we put it into network, we apply some filters in the layers, and it produces some output. And this output is called a feature map. And we will need this for this explanation. So uh, yes, the deeper net the layer is, the more complex structures it contains. And uh, how do we find the GradCam visualization or the GradCam, how do we compute it, is that we uh, look at uh, the feature maps of the last layer. So uh, we find the gradients of the target class score with the respect to the feature maps of the last convolution layer. Intuitively, it tells us how important each uh, each uh, fee, um, sorry each channel is with regard to the target class. So. Uh, if we have these uh, filters here that we use for creating the feature maps, so how important each filter was when applied to the previous inputs in the layer to classify as the class. And we will see this more maybe on the next example. So here again, we have the layers. So it is from the top to bottom are, convolu are the layers of the network. So we have classic convolution, max pooling, dropout, and so on. And we see that those are the uh, feature maps that were produced by the first uh, layer. So those are the outputs of uh, the operation of applying the filters to the image. And as we progress lower or deeper into the network, we see the get well they also get smaller but they also get much more uh 
weirder, like we are not sure what it is. Sometimes we can see an image of a dog, for example. And also some of those get, more of those get uh, black, if it's black. So they get dark, which means that uh, this, uh, when we are applying this filter, it didn't get excited by the input that it got. So it didn't find any features that it was looking for. So only the ones that are highlighted here, are actually the features that we were looking for. And this is what we then visualize in the GradCam method. So uh, here are some outputs of the GradCam. So, and these are actually the, as we've said, like the excited filters or feature maps, the excited neurons in the last layer, last convolutional layer. And uh, here it's interesting to compare. So basically we have different, uh, networks and uh, the p is the probability of the target of the class that is here in the front row and we can see that um, the the overlay of the grad cam what we, we can see that in the bigger in the better predictions it actually shows us more of the image of the of the class in the image. So for example, if we are classifying the frog in the not so good classification, we can see that the network is looking at the features that are here. Uh, so the legs and not that much the rest of it, but in the best uh, classification, we can see, okay, it sees the leg and sees the eye. So it gives us some other meaning of those uh, predictions. And here is again an uh, um, example on uh, another kind of data set. And this just had to, the, the classification task was to find out which of the body part it is. So uh, we can see probably the front side of the uh, brain was important for classification as a as a head and so on. And now let's get to an example. So we will use GradCam for our favorite G quadruplexes data set to find out which uh, bases were important for our decision. So we open it same as always. We go to our GitHub and find the 11 GradCam and I actually have it here in the next window. Oh, this is a spoiler because I ran it here. So maybe if we want to play with it, then we, we have it run already because it takes some time. Anyways, we are using the same data set as yesterday and as Peter, and we are using a similar network. So there is not much news in this, but there are news in the other things. So again, we import some libraries as always, and we pre-process the data set. So this we have seen before. Now we use the model with dropout. So it's a bit a uh, simpler model that Peter showed, but it will be enough for our use. And now actually, since we are looking at the grad cam, so remember this is the uh, visualization of the last convolutional layer. Um, it's, uh, it's useful for us. We will see later in the code that we name our uh, layer. So there is a parameter that we can name our layers. It, this helps us with debugging or it helps us here because in our computations, we need to address the last convolutional layer exactly. So that's why we name it. And we proceed as always. So uh, assign an optimizer, compile, and of course we fit the model. So it somehow learns, right? It's, it's not that bad actually. And the training data, as we can see, then just to see again, there is a visualization. So it's not that bad, we can kind of believe it. And here we actually have to, because I don't know about you, but maybe you do, you can because you are a biologist, but I cannot uh, find the G quadruplex in the sequence by eye. So here we will have to trust it, but let's visualize what it looks for. 
So we define a grad camp. Our function is a bit more complicated unless there are some specific questions about it, maybe, maybe better in the groups at the end. We will not go through it because it goes through the network and copies the gradients and then it puts together the heat maps, which are the, the excited filters or features. And uh, here we are actually just using it. So this is uh, already a simpler method that just uh, we see we need the name of the last uh, convolutional layer because we will use it. Then we take some sample that we will uh, um, that we will want to explore. So this is from the test training set. We take a sample and we have to reshape it. This is because the network is expecting uh, the input to be in the form of batch and then the uh, shape of the actual data sample. But since we are giving it just one sample, we uh, we have to add that we are uh, minus one means we are not defining the number of uh, samples in the batch. So if you put just one here, you would be also correct. This is just so our network can process it. And then we predict this sample. So this is just a function. We will use it later. So there are not outputs yet. And uh, also we will create a heat map. So this is these are the these are the the highlights of the image that we then we will show. So this is the more difficult function that computes the gradients and stuff that we didn't went through. And then we will just show it. So we will see this later. And then we have a function to visualize it. Uh, this we don't have to go through. We will see the output. But important thing is that it takes something to visualize. We will give it later. So now we will use it. So we pick, pick some random example. So from the let's begin an example number two. So actually the third one from the uh, data set test. And uh, it's already one hot encoded. This is this is the pre-processed testing data set that we created before uh, to test our network on. And we just use the method that we just saw to apply the grad, uh, grad cam. So we can see this is our prediction. Uh, if you remember, uh, since we have just one output neuron, we are classifying it. We have binary classification. So just contains or doesn't contain yes or no. So we just used one neuron. Since this output is close to 0, and we've trained the network that 0 is negative, so it doesn't contain. It predicts like this, and uh, we actually took a negative sample. So this is very close to being correct, or we can say it's correct. Here is just a very simple visualization of the heat map. So these are the highlights uh, that we got. And we now have to connect it with our sequence. Now, here is uh, just the print of uh, the sequence that we took and the label. So we see it is negative. It doesn't contain quadruplex. And we continue with just putting it together. Uh, here, uh, we are just putting it into a data frame with pandas library. This is just the library to uh, help us work with uh, data, let's say, simply. Anyways, this is very simple code. You can actually try to apply this also later when we work uh, with your project. If you manage to have a network to train it, you can visualize them. And here we only plot. So this is just a different uh, color scheme for the weird uh, thing that we saw here, right? This is just, uh, basically those are just numbers from zero to one, as we can see here, meaning how much uh, was the network looking at the, at the input. So imagine this as the highlight of an image, but with a sequence. So uh, actually, this we have a negative example without a quadruplex. So let's just apply this onto a positive example also. 
and now we can look at them in comparison. So the top one is the knot with a quadruplex and the bottom one has a quadruplex structure. And yeah, we can see similar to what Peter was talking about before to what were visualized by the integrated gradients. So it cares about the G's a lot, but it also cares about some symbols that maybe are in between groups of G's somehow splitting them. So the high, the dark places are what it was looking for. So again, some numbers of G's here with a T. I hope you can see it well. We can also make it bigger by, by clicking. And yes, also just so you are not confused because the sequence is too long, I split it in halves. So this is the top is the first part, the bottom is the second part. But yes, it kind of gives, gives us some explanation, but I still don't know how to find a G quadruplex from this, but it's very interesting to see what it's looking for. Well, this was the example for Gradcam. And if I'm correct... Uh... David, there is, a, there is also a question uh, saying, is Gradcam a special case of the salience map from before uh, applied only so, for the last convolution layer? Um, all right, so... Uh, Uh, well, let's how to how to answer the best. Maybe what's the maybe you can you can say what's the difference between the uh, grad cam and the salience map if you know. Mm -hmm. So the salience map we saw in this picture explained that okay which never which uh, input we change to somehow uh, make this output right and for the uh grad cam it's it more cares about uh for so um the gradients are compared uh, are computed differently so uh the gradient uh, so when we compute this we use uh partial derivations and before we were uh, computing it for the saliency map with uh, the output, the output with the respect to the input pixels, and here we are computing it with the respect to the feature maps. Which the feature maps are just excited uh, neurons in the last convolutional layer. So it's more like um, which of these filters contributed or were excited uh, by the input uh, when we inputted the picture. So when we inputted this picture of a dog and told it, we, we are curious why it classifies it as a dog, the, pic the overlay that it visualizes are basically like the shapes to put it together, let's say. So uh, it's the combination of uh, the feature maps from the convolutional layer. Um, not sure if it was enough or it's better seen when we get to the computation, which is too mathematical to like go through it here. I have to explain how it computes in the network, but uh, the main difference in the idea is that it doesn't look at uh, the, like, how should we change the pixel, but it more likes look at um, which features, which filters in the con last convolutional layer actually found what they were looking for. I will I will maybe I, think about it if it wasn't yeah, enough. I think, and... I think that's uh, that's fine. Um, okay, so we have a ten minute break, and uh, and then we can. Uh, yes, so uh, right now. So we will be back it's... at uh, five two.
Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> not sure. I will. I will try try to answer it. I, I think the maybe the reason uh, for the question or like there might be a bit of uh, uh, confusion about the differences about the gradient, uh, grad cam and uh, integrated gradients because in the end they all look like a visualization of some important pixels above an image, right? So here is a uh, example from the paper of uh, Gradcam that introduced it. And here for uh, going from the right bottom, going to the left, and then going from the right on the top to the left again, we have uh, convolutional layers or more like the activations uh, function and their output. So basically, uh, we inputted the image of a dog and a cat, and the this is like for like evaluation, let's say. So we ask the network, what is this image? And here we can see what uh, filters got excited. So in the first uh, convolution, we see that the highlighted things that got excited are some like lines and uh, curves and stuff like that. And when we continue further, like deeper, we see that maybe some bigger shapes got uh, noticed, like an ear, like a nose. And when we continue further, we see again, we are at some shapes like a window. So because the network learned how, probably learned how a window looks like, because for example, this was an image net, so thousand of classes. So there was probably a window. So there are some filters that get excited by a window and so on, we continue. And then in the end, we get to uh, the last layers getting excited by the pre, by, by like combining the uh, layers from before. And we see that they got, they are getting to the more complex examples. So may, maybe here, there is still a window. Uh, there is something like, okay, there is probably a cat, maybe it thinks and stuff like that. So basically how the input pixels relate to the uh, convolutional last convolutional layer is that uh, through all the layers before, the last convolutional layer got somehow excited. Some of the filters found what they were looking for. And that's what we visualize. So we visualize the, fi uh, the filters over the image. We don't visualize the single pixels. Uh, that would look probably a little bit different. I, I hope. Yeah, but Just... I think that's fine. Okay. Uh, so maybe I will share my screen now and uh, we can continue to the next uh, to the next part. Okay, so I will just give a, a very quick uh, kind of um, some thoughts about the uh, future perspectives or uh, wh where this whole thing is going uh, uh, with deep learning biomedical research. Uh, it's just some selected ideas, but uh, you know, obviously the, the subject is very wide. So, uh, you know, there can be hundreds of reviews written and then we, we will still not exhaust the, all the ideas. So one thing I wanted to, to talk about is um, I showed this uh, little uh, cartoon in the beginning uh, and, and explained that uh, using deeper networks uh, basically uh, cuts out uh, the, an ex the expert out of the equation of feature extraction uh, instead uh, having uh, some layer, extra layers of the network do understand, learn to understand, um, you know, uh, as we saw, you know, what is a face or what is a line or what is a, a stretch of G nucleotides and so on. Um, and this has really allowed us to uh, make models that are uh, in, in, for questions that we might not have very good theoretical knowledge about how things should work. Um, that said, uh, I, uh, people are starting to, to see, to feel that uh, this machine or this machine learning techniques, these new machine learning techniques are kind of uh, 
um, going off on their own without uh, and, and kind of not, uh, uh, you know, let, let uh, taking the experts out of the equation completely and kind of automating the whole process uh, creates, uh, creates kind of nonsense uh, outputs. And I've seen this, uh, you know, this kind of notion again and again, um, especially coming from medical doctors and uh, and biologists, uh, you know, that um, uh, basically if you don't have if you don't have input uh, curated manually curated by an expert, uh, you're not going to get anything uh, out of it. And I think the what we need to keep in mind is that uh, now since we have this uh, uh, experimental data in biology start to become very large, uh, we're reaching the limits of, of a human understanding. Uh, maybe a few years, uh, maybe a couple of decades ago, you could actually, if you spent enough time, you could actually sit down and look at all the sequences that your sequencing produced. But, you know, today this is, impossible. Um, so uh, we should be looking at this type of methods as a tool, another tool for assisting humans to understand or experts to understand uh, to understand their data. Uh, another, another thing that is interesting for me is that there's many data sets that are being produced in biology, for example, that are being produced for one specific uh, task. So for example, someone is doing, you know, next generation sequencing to look at something, but then this data set, uh, these millions and millions, hundreds of millions of reads, for example, have other information that is not being used because, you know, we are asking a very specific question. Uh, so we could be looking at ways uh, uh, to, kind of uh, learn from these data that is available and out there um, for, for uh, like reuse this data for uh, you know other other tasks. Um, another interesting point for me, uh, and we can have a discussion if you want. Um, so feel free to stop me at any point. Another important point for me is that we are reaching the the limit of our ability to keep up with literature. And this is especially very important for med for the medical field, because when you have a doctor that, I mean, it's humanly impossible to read every paper that comes out in the medical literature and be able to understand and, you know, uh, all that, uh, you have a doctor that, uh, I mean, cannot prioritize or can, cannot follow the literature. Um, it, it would be very beneficial to have some kind of, of, of um, tool of, uh, based on, uh, for example, uh, text, uh, um, natural language processing that can, uh, you know, filter, filter the literature and, and present the expert with the, what the tool, uh, you know, understands as relevant information from the literature. Um, for example, even now, uh, I mean, I, I, my field is not uh, at all natural language processing, but even now, uh, we I use, for example, uh, a tool that um, uh, suggests me, suggests to me papers that are interesting in in uh, some fields based on how I have reacted to other papers uh, that I have read. So. You know, this type of tools, I think, will become more and more important. And this is not, again, this is not cutting the expert out of the of the equation, but uh, empowering the expert to um, to to use all this in, or more of this information that is out there and the data that is out there. Um, as an example, uh, I think Peter also mentioned it, but I will put the link down here as well. Uh, this is a, a very nice video that uh, came out uh, just a couple of days ago. So we kind of uh, watched it uh, while we were uh, making the last edits on the slides. Uh, but you can see, for example, here, 
how this uh, uh, explainability of the of the network uh, can help. Uh, for example, this uh, this is a, a paper about uh, retinopathy, so this and I, and uh, you can see that um, in the in the the first image is what a doctor would see. For example, the second image is what the doctor would see plus some scores saying uh, this is probably this this eye has a problem, like has a you know retinopathy. And the third image is a representation showing which parts, again, uh, of this uh, image are important for the network. And this can help focus the attention of the doctor to, uh, you know, to judge if this information is important or not. Why I'm saying all this is um, because sometimes, especially for those of us or of you, because I, I come from biological background, but from uh, people that come from a computer science background, it's very common to fall into the trap of, of just blindly following the, um, you know, the accuracy or the, or some metrics. Uh, but uh, in our, in our um, uh, field here, uh, we need to be, uh, to, to work with, uh, uh, you know, to work also with the experts and with the, with the producing bi um, biological or biomedical knowledge. Uh, so it's very important to, to, to keep, to think about how uh, the results of all these things we're doing will actually help people, will empower people to understand data. So I see, um, I see this type of networks not so much as replacing uh, the scientist as much as being an intermediary between a huge amount of data that is humanly impossible to understand and the person that can pre produce the theory and uh, and um, you know scientific knowledge. So this is just a, one thought. Uh, the la the second thought uh, that I have is um, there's the old saying in machine learning: garbage in, garbage out. If you put noisy data or data that doesn't make sense into a network, it will learn some garbage and then it will give you a bad uh, answers, right? So and today we. Deep learning needs large amounts of data, and uh, you know if you put, uh, if you just uh, take in data sets that are really noisy or have lots of problems, uh, you're going to get uh, lots. You're going to get uh, networks that uh, will be trained uh, on something, but you, they will probably be trained on some kind of uh, you know problem, uh, some kind of artifacts of your data. Uh, so my kind of, uh, the point I want to make here is that it does make sense to try in our community, and I hope many of you will keep working, will, will start or keep working on, on uh, this type of networks. It does make sense to start thinking about making standardized, some good data, clean data sets uh, on which uh, you know, we can um, test models or, uh, you know, do some more theoretical work. Uh, and that has to do with biology. Um, the other thing I want to say is that uh, we should not forget that we are doing science. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, lots of, I, I, I've seen it a lot uh, in, in our work that we try to, we train a model and at first glance the model works perfectly uh, but we don't know why and then once we start digging more we realize that the model has learned some kind of artifact in the data uh, this can be something that comes from experimental techniques uh, for example nucleotide biases are very common in um, you know in, in various techniques that use uh, uh, I could use enzymes, for example, to digest uh, to digest nucleotides, and uh, you know they have a preference, and so on. Um, so my my let's say take home message here would be: don't always trust your uh, your measurements, your accuracy, and so on. Try to 
try to do the, the proper uh, scientific diligence of breaking your model, uh, uh, you know, trying to change your data to see what will break your model, when, it when will it stop learning, uh, try to, uh, you know, give it uh, uh, different negative sets, uh, try to test on in completely independent data, uh, try all these things that you would do or someone would do uh, if they were doing a lab experiment. Uh, don't just, you know, um, get comfortable with getting good numbers on a, a cross-validation test and then, you know, uh, having a model that is not going to be useful uh, at large. Okay, so these are these were kind of my uh, thoughts, um, general thoughts and kind of words of caution here. Uh, always ask why, you know, interpretation is important. Uh, understanding why something, why your network learned something, it might be even more important than actually having a network that works really well uh, without not understanding why it works really well. And um, I, I'm not sure if there's any questions. I will just uh, look at the chat. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, okay, go, good to think of many different kinds of negative controls, yes. Uh, so one thing about, uh, I would say negative controls, um, like basically, if you think of it like this, like if you if you train the model, if you train a model, if you have two ideas about how to produce your negatives, for example, and um, you train your you train a model on both of these ideas, a different model. Um, and this model saw a large difference in what they're learning, uh, then this should be something that you should be thinking about, uh, about wh why are your models learning different things when you're just changing your negative set that should be just kind of a random representation of the background. Um, if, you, if you train the model between these two negative sets, for example, your model would learn something that would be the equivalent of a negative control, right? Um, uh, we've had models that learn the uh, padding, like the ends that we put at the end. We've had models that learn the uh, uh, GC content differences. Um, we've had uh, we've have we've had models that learn the the um, that learn that um, w when you do padding, where you put the sequence in the, like your sequence, if it's centered or if it is a little bit off center. Uh, anyway, we've had models that have learned lots of lots of, and lots of artifacts in the data. And of course, these are the ones we caught, right? Uh, the, this we caught. So it's always important to really look at your data, look at what your, um, uh, your net networks are learning and do sanity checks and and uh, you know and negative controls as much as possible because the more complicated the these tools get the harder it is to really understand them as a human and uh, the easier it becomes to produce or publish something uh, that is nonsense right and we none of us has uh, we, we has time to to deal with these things. Okay, so this is kind of my words of caution I left for the end. And now some, uh, I will give a, a few links um, to further reading if you want to continue. Um, so I have uh, um, some books here uh, that uh, we have found useful in, uh, in the lab. And um, some of them are, uh, use uh, TensorFlow that we use today. Others use FastAI, which is a different uh, library. Uh, but uh, you should, I mean, either of them works uh, work well. Um, so I just put these books here. I'm not going to give an explanation of each book, but uh, you know, if you if you want to 
uh, to start getting into these are all introductory if you st want to start getting into deep learning either either one of these books would be a good starting point and also i have a few tutorials here a few links to tutorials that you can do um, and uh, to so there's three links to, to tutorial sites. Uh, then there's two uh, online courses that are really good. Uh, the one is uh, Fast AI, uh, and the other is a more theoretical course uh, from I don't remember which university. Um, uh, that uh, you know gives a really solid understanding of uh, uh, deep learning. And finally, I just uh, want to point to Kaggle that uh, has lots of data sets and competitions. So I think many people uh, just use that to, you know, have a, have a kind of side uh, project uh, just for fun to learn things. And uh, they have a good community uh, where, you know, people compete, but also like uh, help each other uh, to, with, the, with their code and so on. Uh, so this is, uh, I believe, all for me. I want just again to thank everybody, uh, especially Peter, Blast, and David that uh, did most of the talking these two days. Uh, and uh, now we are going to, um, oh yeah, important. There's the feedback form, the link is here. Uh, maybe uh, someone or I can uh, paste, um, okay. Uh, anyway, I'll paste it on the on the chat as well. Please fill out this form. Uh, there you can say how much you like this tutorial or if you didn't like it. Uh, and um, uh, leave any comments. You know, there is, it's a short form. It will take you a couple of minutes. And uh, you can uh, also suggest, uh, I mean, we're going to see the, the answer. So uh, we won't know who, who it is, obviously. Um, but you can suggest even ideas about future tutorials. We did this. We did a tutorial on deep learning last year in CB. We did this year, we don't know if we'll do it next year. But if there is a sufficiently different uh, idea or a focus, uh, we could we could consider it. Uh, any other further comments you have? Ideas, questions? You have a idea for collaboration? You want to invite us to your institute to give a seminar? Whatever you want. Uh, please feel free to contact me at my email or any uh, any other person in the in the group here. You should have their emails from the organizers. And I believe that's all from me. Uh, now we will go to the uh, the project. And um, well, participation here is optional. Uh, so if you were just here for the ride or to, to watch, that's fine. You can leave. Uh, if you want to try your your own, uh, you know, try yourself to um, to build a small a, a small model um, with the help of the of the guys, then uh, just stay and uh, and uh, you know we'll have one hour to to try that. So I would say maybe. At this point, uh, I will uh, stop sharing my screen and uh, let uh, Peter take over, right? Okay, so the idea is that we will now split into four groups uh, because we have like four instructors that can help you. Uh, as we have said, it's like optional. We understand that if somebody was with us from 4 a.m., he or she probably wants to take breakfast uh, if you already have like 8 p.m in the evening like or it was you know long two days we fully understand that like not everybody wants to stay us for another uh, 30 minutes or so but if you want to touch like the real problem if you want to like uh, remind what we have done and like like your own code we have prepared a small data set it's basically uh, 10,000 plus 10,000, so totally 20,000 uh, short DNA sequences that are coming either from the coding genomic region or, or from intergenic region. And uh, like uh, we will share, uh, so we will share the code 
um, um, maybe that's something that, that we can study together. So I will share the screen. Okay. If we go to our GitHub, mm -hmm, this is not working. Still not working for me. Okay, hopefully here it will do better. So if you go to bit ly slash eccd and this year number. So uh, the last uh, exercise of day two is practice. And we actually have like two version. One is really empty and the other is with the data processing. So I might like the, the practice looks like this. It's really only like when you can find the data. Uh, the second version will like hint you like how to how to load the data and do the one hot encoding and we have like yet another version that 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 already has the train network so whatever you, what you want 